Good morning. I asked David several weeks ago if I could light the Christ candle this morning in celebration of being here one year ago. Um, I married Bill Thomas one year ago today, and that has been such a blessing in my life. Many of you know um, how I prayed, and many of you prayed for me that God would help me through a troubled time and find a partner for me, a companion, um, and he did. My prayers were answered. Initially, that was why I wanted to light this candle, but I also stand before you with another answered prayer. Cameron, my youngest, who's 12, spent a week in the hospital with pneumonia and asthma, and our prayers were answered on Friday evening at 8 o'clock when we came home. And I stand before you again so blessed because so many of you, our family, called, texted, visited, checked in on us, and we could feel your prayers all week long, and that's what sustained us. So thank you for so many blessings and for being so blessed and allowing me to share my life and my experiences with you. Hear now these words from the book of Galatians. God's spirit makes us loving, happy, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, and self-controlled. There is no law against behaving in any of these ways. And because we belong to Christ Jesus, we have killed our selfish feelings and desires. God's spirit has given us life, and so we should follow the Spirit. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's join together now as we sing our hymn of praise, number 411, How Firm a Foundation, hymn number 411. Let's stand together as we sing.
Good morning, boys and girls. How are y'all today? Good? I'm good, too. It's a happy day. And this morning, I want to ask you a question. I'll ask Lauren and Cole right first. Do you all ever argue with each other? Sometimes? You look pretty happy right now, but sometimes it's, um, sometimes it's a struggle, isn't it? You have to share things and Somebody says something, one of you says something that annoys the other one. It just happens sometimes. What do you do when you have an argument? You do what? You fight a little bit? <laughs> That's true, but how do you stop fighting? What happened? You don't know. Are you still fighting? Have you stopped? You be nice and say you are sorry. Cole, that's probably the smartest thing I've heard this weekend. That was amazing. Sometimes we expect peace just to happen. We think if we walk around and, and do what we're supposed to do and don't bother anybody that there will be peace. But sometimes we have to go out of our way and do something a little extra to find peace. Like Cole said, we have to be nice and say we're sorry. And that helps so much when we're looking for peace. I had a friend that had a, used to have a plaque on his desk that said, seek peace and pursue it. And the first time I looked at it, I, you know, I was, I was under the impression that peace was just the absence of conflict. But peace is something that we make. It's not something that just happens all by itself. And we make peace by following Jesus and loving people like Jesus did. You know, there's another kind of peace that comes to mind, too. Can you think of another kind of peace? What kind of peace, Landon? That is wonderful advice. We have to listen and enjoy the things that we do all the time, and that'll bring peace. But there's another kind of peace I was thinking about. A piece of candy. <laughs> so I will, I'll say a prayer, and then you all can each choose one piece of candy. Let's have prayer. God, we thank you for this day and for showing us peace through your Son, for showing us peace through your word. Help us to be peacemakers. These things we pray in Christ. Amen. While Tim hands out, you know, I didn't know where he was going. Another type of peace? I, I, anyway, I just didn't go there. Um, let me start by saying thank you. Thank you to the congregation at First Baptist uh, this coming Saturday is our annual Inasmuch Day. Uh, this will be the 15th year that we have uh, done an operation Inasmuch at First Baptist Church. But this year we're doing it a little bit differently. This year will be an uh, Inasmuch United Lumberton project. And it's united because we are uniting with four other churches. Um, First Baptist Church will be joining First Presbyterian, Godwin Heights Baptist, Chestnut Street United Methodist, and Asbury United Methodist to partner together to do missions and ministry in our community. If you have signed up, thank you. There are t-shirts directly out this door. You need to get one that is your size. Obviously, this probably will only fit some of the people that just walked out of the room here. Um, but we have t-shirts for you if you are participating. We would love uh, for you to have one of these. If you have not signed up, uh, there are sign-up sheets out there, and you can uh, choose to do so. We have, oh my goodness. 20, 22 different projects that you can choose from. But let me share a couple stories that will take place this weekend. Both of them are from our construction projects. We will be going out to South Lumberton uh, to Mamie Harrison's house. Mamie is an 80-year-old African-American lady. Uh, she is a preacher on the weekends. But Mamie is still working five days a week because her Social Security just does not stretch far enough by the end of the month for her to pay all of her bills. Mamie's roof has been leaking for the last five years. We're gonna go out on Friday and we're gonna rip off the old roof and put the felt down and on Saturday, we're gonna get the shingles on that roof. Now, let me describe her house to you. Her house is a square cinder block house that you probably could put in this sanctuary 10 times. 
if you look down the right hand side you'll see where our bathroom was added on if you look down the left hand side you'll see where uh, the kitchen was added on all of the plumbing is on the outside of the house because this house once had an outhouse behind it saturday night when mamie goes to bed for the first time in five years she will not have to put a bucket over her kitchen table to catch any rain that might fall because of the generosity and the work of people in this congregation and in the other churches saturday we're going to be out in the shannon community actually it'll be a little bit closer to rennert there's a gentleman that is a recent amputee he's a diabetic um, but he cannot get in and out of the mobile home that he has because he now only has one leg and is using crutches and a wheelchair he has to invite friends over to help lift him out of his own home so that he can go places saturday we'll be building a 30-foot ramp on the front of his house so that he can now get in and out of his home by himself. Those are the types of things that take place on In As Much Day. We have many things. If you can't swing a hammer, that's not a problem. Um, did you know you do not have to be on a roof to do a roof? We need as much help on the ground picking up the, the trash and all from the roof as we do on it. But you don't even have to do construction. If you can simply go share a kind word, we have a visitation project that's gonna take place where we have combined the nursing facility and the assisted living list of all of the five churches together. And we're gonna to try to visit all of those that are no longer able to come on Sunday to worship with us. We're gonna visit those. There are many other projects for you to choose from. I encourage you to choose one and be a partner with us. One last thing, if you can't participate on Saturday, if you'd write that down, we have things that need to take place this week. We can put you to work. Thank you so much, God bless you. I would like for you all to participate as we sing our anthem this morning. It's entitled God's Peace, but it incorporates the hymn that we're going to sing later in the worship service, number 655, Come Away from Rush and Hurry. So if you would, take a hymnal and look at hymn number 655 and see the words and imagine what our lives should be like as we trust in God. Worship with us as we share God's peace.
When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I, I see heaven open up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the litany printed in your order of worship. Um, if you'll read the bold part. Lord, so many people are in pain. Teach us the way to peace. When people around us don't agree and think differently. Lord, teach us to listen and understand. When we see people getting hurt. Lord, teach us to speak up. When we see people who are hungry and poor. Lord, teach us to give to them like you give to us. When we see people treated poorly because of their skin color or language. Lord, teach us to be an example of love. When we see war and conflict around the world. Lord, teach us how to make a difference and bring peace. When we see pain. Lord, teach us to bring healing. When we feel low and things don't seem to be going well. Lord, teach us to talk to our friends, our family, and to you. In our lives, our neighborhoods, and in the world. Lord, teach us to pray and teach us the way to peace. Amen. Now let's join together as we sing hymn, hymn number 655. Come away from rush and hurry. Hymn number 655. Let's stand together as we sing this, our offertory hymn. <laughs> Generous God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You have richly blessed us 
in so many ways. And so we take time this morning to pause, to give you thanks, to give a portion of what you have given us back to you. And may our gifts today just be one way in which our lives are made sacrifices to you and to the work of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. The song that we're doing for you this morning is to help us remember that if we keep our eyes on God, then he will give us that deep peace and understanding. Thank you. 
And God's children say, Amen. Beautiful music. Thank you very much. In an article in the Washington Post magazine of a few years ago, Bob Garfield tells the story of an experience that he had on a business trip in Korea. He had spent the day talking with some business executives and had dinner with them and at the end of the day, after their dinner, he went to his hotel to kind of wind down for the evening and begin to get rest. He started to prepare for bed, and as he was doing so, he felt a crushing pain on his chest. It started to radiate down his arm, and he immediately had an idea of what was taking place. He was beginning, beginning to fear that he was having a heart attack. Thinking that it was serious, he thought, first of all, that he needed to call for help, as any of us would as well. But then he had the idea, or he pictured what it would be like for him to be in a Korean hospital. And that thought made him feel worse. So he decided to not call anyone. He would just take his chance. He reached over and took a piece of paper, and despite this pain that he was feeling... He wrote a note, a note of farewell to his family, assuring them of his love for them and his great love for their life together. In the article, Bob writes that he had had a good life, that he loved his family and that they loved him. 
He didn't make a secret of his love, nor they a secret of their love for him. He had done well in his job and his career and had some successes and learned some things. He had provided for his family well. He, he had never had any run-ins with the law, and he would be able to leave his family with means to support their lives. He wrote this note and he sealed it up and then he told himself, just go to sleep, Bob. Just go to sleep. And you might just wake up. About six hours later, he did wake up. And as soon as he woke, he says he was overjoyed. Not just for the fact that he was still alive and that the pain was gone, but he was overjoyed by the fact that he knew then at that moment that he was at peace with his life and that he could face death head on and even embrace it. That was a wonderful awareness, he said, that I was at peace enough to be able to face death. Bob's is an interesting story, but it's one thing to face the possibility of death by a heart attack peacefully, but it's altogether different to face the certainty of death at the hands of an angry mob and to do so peacefully the way that Stephen does. Doug has read for us just the, a portion of Stephen's story, really the last few moments of Stephen's life. So let me remind you once again of who this fella is. Back in the sixth chapter of Acts, we first meet Stephen. He is one of the first deacons of the church, or these individuals who were called out by the church to help with the daily distribution of food. There were some Hellenist widows, some Greek widows, who were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food, and so they thought it a good idea to elect seven who would serve these folks. And Stephen, considered to be full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, was chosen for this task. I'm sure he embraced it joyfully, but not just the taking of food to folks. It wasn't that he was just a, a Meals on Wheels volunteer. Rather, certainly other doors opened up and opportunities for Stephen to, to truly minister to some folks. And that's how ministry happens, by the way. This Saturday, as you go about cutting firewood and putting on roofs, you will have the opportunity to do other acts of kindness in conversation with others or in offering an encouraging word. That's how ministry works. It often happens while you're busy doing something else. Stephen was busy delivering the food, but certainly he would take the time to pray with those that he was serving. Perhaps he would pray a healing prayer on someone, someone who was ill. Stephen would pray for them, perhaps even lay hands on them. And it's certainly within reason to think that those folks may have been healed as a result of Stephen's prayers. It's also quite likely that other folks would drop by as Stephen was delivering the meals and it gave him an opportunity to share a word about the Lord. Let me tell you about Jesus, Stephen would probably say, and share his testimony or a witness about the power of Christ. None of these things are, are, are beyond possibility because Luke tells us back in chapter 6 that Stephen did many wondrous signs and wonders amongst the people. Not just delivering food, but, but for praying for people and, and, and sharing the word of Christ. Stephen does some, some wonderful things for the folks. So wonderful that he draws the attention of the temple authorities. Those temple authorities, the priests, the Sadducees, and, and this council of freedmen that Luke speaks of. They get very nervous when people start upsetting the status quo and Stephen is all about upsetting the status quo or rocking the boat. And so they start watching him. Watching his every move. Listening to him preach and listening to him teach. They like some of what they're hearing. But the part about Jesus Christ they certainly don't agree with. And so they start forming a case against Stephen. 
some of it true, the fact that he loved Jesus Christ, but most of it totally erroneous, that he was upsetting people. They form this case and they get all their lies in order and they get themselves a little pool of witnesses to come and tell some stories about Stephen. And then they call him into the temple. They call him before the council of the freedmen, this temple council who is there to keep the peace, so to speak, to keep things from getting out of the hand. And they tell their stories about Stephen. They call him a heretic. They call him someone who is trying to disturb the peace. And as the council hears what is going on and these accusations against Stephen, Luke says that they looked intently at him. They looked at him with a very stern face. And as they looked intently at them, Luke says they saw that he had the face of an angel. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Think of that. Think of being accused of all kinds of falsehoods. Not only here in the church, but suppose you're even accused out in the town somewhere and you're brought before a judge and a jury and they tell their lies and their stories all about you. And then the judge and the jury, they look at you sternly. Would you have the ability to have the face of an angel? Would you be at total peace and calm the way Stephen is reported to be? I don't know that I could. Well, now, in the interest of fairness, the council does give Stephen the opportunity to speak. And Stephen speaks. He speaks quite well. If you'll read the seventh chapter of Acts, you will hear that Stephen's speech. It's actually a sermon, a sermon that begins with all the way back to the patriarchs of the Hebrew faith. He mentions Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and, and spends most of his time talking about Moses. And he talks about these great men of God and how they were prophets and how the Spirit of God worked in and through them to do great things, to lead the people forward and and in all honesty, the temple hears this and they think, well, yes, that's true. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, these were great men of God. And, and, and he's right, they were persecuted. They were tried. They endured great circumstances of difficulty. Stephen talks about all of these great patriarchs. And then he says, and you know, the same is true today. For the Spirit of God is still working. The Spirit of God is still breathing amongst people. And the Spirit of God was certainly in Jesus. But yet you are too stiff-necked to, to see it. You can't see what God is continuing to do in this day because you're so tied to tradition and so tied to the, to the patriarchs that you can't see that God was in Christ. You're blind. You're too stiff-necked, Stephen says. And that's all he needed to say. That's all he needed to say. And they come out of their seats. They grab hold of him. And they usher him right out of the temple. And they start for heading for the city limits. And as they go, they pick up their stones. And once they get just to the outside of town, they start throwing those stones at Stephen. Pelting him. And Stephen stands there. Looking up to heaven. Standing in perfect peace, looking up to heaven and seeing God in Christ, even though he is being pelted by these stones. Stephen is indeed a portrait of peace in this story, for even in the midst of great chaos, the worst kind of chaos, Stephen remains calm and quiet. He doesn't flinch. He doesn't lash out. He doesn't return hostility with anger, but simply he looks up to the source of his peace, the source of his comfort, and he prays. Now, this makes sense to us, doesn't it? This story is perfectly reasonable for us who are in Christ. We understand this. After all, Stephen has done good work. He has been true to his calling. He has fulfilled his ordination. He has helped the helpless. He has served the poor. 
And when he had the opportunity to speak a word of testimony for Christ, he stood with unrelenting courage and confidence and stood up for Christ. And because he has done such good work, Stephen has every reason to be at peace. You know what it is to do a good job at something, to, to find that point in your life where you simply did your very best and that sense of peace about it. Well, Stephen feels that here. He has done good work, and in fact, he's actually just taken the Lord at his word. Remember back in the 10th chapter of Matthew, as Jesus is talking with his disciples, preparing them for what lies ahead? And Jesus says, now there's going to come a day when you will be arrested. You will be brought before governors and councils, Jesus actually says. And they will lobby all kinds of false accusations about you. They will lie about you. They will come up with everything. But don't worry about what you're going to say, Jesus says. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. I don't know if Stephen was there when Jesus said that, but Stephen is practicing that. Here he is, arrested and brought before this council. He is lied about, all kinds of false accusations, and yet he stands there with confidence and with courage, and he speaks out of his heart. I would imagine Stephen was probably as surprised by what he said as the council was, because these were not his words. These were the Lord's words. And by speaking the Lord's words, Stephen proves that old adage true. That adage that says that God doesn't care about our ability, more God cares about our availability. That God does not ask us what we can do. He simply asks us to be available, to be humble, to be willing to be earthen vessels that God can pour his love and grace and truth through us. God does not care of our ability, but our availability and asks that we be of use to him by simply giving of ourselves. And Stephen does that. And so he is at peace. He trusted. He knew the Lord had his back. Now, he would also remind us that living this way just giving ourselves over to God that it can get us into some trouble. It might even get us killed. But Stephen would also remind us that it is better for us to die in peace than it is for us to live in fear and anxiety. Another way to say it is that it is better for us to live life from the center. Life from the center is a phrase that runs through one of my favorite books. The book is A Testament of Devotion written by Thomas Kelly many years ago. It's only about 100 pages, but it has a, a lifetime of truth in it about what it means for us to live as Christ would have us to live in this life. Kelly says we make life far too difficult than we should, that we often get blinded by the things that we think we want and that the things that would really make for peace and joy and love really are matters to be received rather than to be grabbed hold of. The things that we think we want get in the way of what we truly desire in life. And the best way for us to live is to live life from the center, to live life from that place within us that is shaped and formed by God and Christ. For life from the center, Kelly says, is a life of unhurried peace and power. It is a life that is simple and serene. It is triumphant and it is radiant. It takes no time, but it requires all of our time. And it makes our life programs new and overcoming. For we need not get frantic, for he is at the helm. And when our little day is done, we lie down quietly in peace, for all is well. We lie down quietly in peace. Did you hear that that's what Stephen did? I love the way that the translation that Doug read for us says it. That Stephen wasn't stoned to death. That translation says that Stephen went to sleep. 
to lay down in peace. Despite the hell that was breaking out all around him, he lay down in peace. For all was well. That's life from the center. A life of peace. A life of quiet calm. A life that grows naturally, very easily, from a life that is dedicated to abiding in Christ. Now we've talked about what it means to abide in Christ over the last few weeks as we think about the fruit of the Spirit. But I haven't told you about Jim. Jim was a fellow who would come down to the church every day. Don't know if he was homeless, but if he wasn't, he, he didn't have much. Now, this didn't happen in our church, but it, it happened in, in a church, I think over in California somewhere. But, but Jim would come down to the church every afternoon about 12.15. One afternoon, the, the janitor noticed him and, and wondered what was going on with him. Noticed him the next day as well, and the next, and the next. Every day, same time, 12, 15, Jim would come down to the church. He would come down the aisle of the church, and he would stand right there in front of the altar. And he would just stand there, it seemed. Stand there for four or five minutes, and then he was out the door, on his way. Didn't take anything, didn't disturb anything, didn't cause any harm, didn't speak to anyone. Just come in. Stand on his way. Well, the janitor went to the pastor and said, there's a fellow who's been coming into the church every afternoon, 1215. He doesn't cause any harm, but I just wanted someone to know about it. And the pastor thanked the janitor and said, I tell you what, since you're concerned about this, go up to him tomorrow if he comes in and asks him if there's anything that we can do for him at the church. Does he need to talk to a minister or anything? The janitor just said, I'll do just that. Well, the next day, 12, 15, Jim walks in. And as he gets close to the altar, the janitor comes in and says, Hey, excuse me, friend. I I'm just wondering. I've noticed you come into the church every day. And, and the pastor and, and everyone just wants to know you're okay. Is, is there anything that you need from the church? Can we help you any way? Jim was a little embarrassed at first. He said, no, there's nothing I need. I, I hope it's okay that I come into the church. I, I know I don't look like much, and, and I'm not trying to disturb anything. It's just I, I like coming into this place to pray for a few minutes. I, I don't know much about how to pray, but I, I come and I stand right here in front of this altar, and, and I just say, Jesus, it's Jim. And that's all I know to say. But I think somehow the Lord might know what I mean by that. And then I go on my way. Is it okay if I do that? Sure. That's fine. You, you come as often as you want. And he did. Jim came the next day and the next and the next. And for a couple more weeks, every day, Jim would show up. 12, 15. Say his prayer. And then out the door. Finally, one day, Jim didn't show up. The janitor didn't think a whole lot about it, but he didn't show up the next day either, or the next. And for a handful of weeks there, Jim didn't show up, and the janitor and the pastor and others thought, well, he's just a drifter. He's just kind of come in and going back out, and it's the kind of fellow who never stays very, at one place very long. Don't worry about it. He'll be fine. About a week or so later, the pastor got a phone call. It was from one of the sisters down at the Catholic nursing home. The home that welcomes people who have been beaten up by life and who have no one else to take care of them. And the sister asked to talk to the pastor of the church and, and she said, we have a fella here that's been here now for about a month named Jim. And uh, he, he talks about having been to your church, son. And, and we just thought you might need to know that he is here. The pastor thanked the, the sister and said, you know, I think I'll go see him tomorrow. Check on him. 
So the next day rolled around and the pastor goes to the nursing home and, and as he walks in, the, the sister there who's in charge of the place, she stops him and said, let me tell you something. When Jim got into this facility, we had to put him in the most cantankerous ward that we have. Not because of him in any way, but just there wasn't any other room anywhere. A place filled with people with all kinds of problems. Troublemakers. People who are half crazy. And, and every one of my nurses and the nuns have been in that ward and we have tried to calm the men down in there, but we haven't been successful. Everything we've tried, we've failed. But we put Jim in there a month ago. And today, that ward is the most peaceful place in this whole facility. We don't know why. We don't know what it is that Jim is doing. So she said, I went to him the other day and I asked him, Jim, why is it that you have been able to bring so much peace and calm to this place, this place that was so chaotic? What is your secret? What are you doing? And Jim kind of blushed again and said, oh, it's not me. It's not me at all. It's, it's my visitor that I have. You know, my, my visitor. The sister looked over to the pastor and said, you know, I see everyone who comes in this place. No one comes in here that I don't know about it. And I know every one of our patients who has a visitor. And I know how often they come. And I can tell you that Jim has never had a visitor. In the month that he's been here, no one has sat in his room, in his chair. And so I asked him about that. Jim, what are you talking about? You haven't had a visitor. No one has been to see you. What are you talking about? Jim said, well, every day at about noon, he comes in, and he stands at the foot of my bed, and he says, Jim, it's Jesus. Let us pray. Oh, the peace we often forfeit. Lord, I pray that we would accept Receive and celebrate the peace that is ours in Jesus Christ. It is a peace that passes understanding, a peace that comes straight from your Holy Spirit. It comes, O oh Lord, as we abide in you, in our prayers, in our devotion, in our simply staying true to you. Lord, help us to remember our part in receiving that peace that passes understanding. Help us in cultivating life from the center so that we might be peace-filled, peace-loving, peace-making children of God. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of commitment is number 587, Make Me a Channel of Your Peace. Let's stand together as we sing and respond to God's grace.